NFFC Disney Anna Fan Club Legends Award. He, of course, has a window on Main Street and everything. Now retired, but uh, thanks to uh, uh, working with Dennis Tanade and everything, Tony has come today to share some things with us about his amazing career that started when he was very, very young. Uh, and uh, started going to, to theme parks uh, uh, around the area and things. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dennis Taneda and Tony Baxter. Thank you. Postscript to all of your, your intros. Let's see if we can remember them all. Um, if you can't wait till the Clifton's Cafeteria, if you love Jules Verne, the same owners, and I can't remember their name either, have a place called the Edison. Oh, the Edison. The Edison, the Edison. on, on yeah. 2nd Street that is incredible. It's down underground in an abandoned Edison power plant. Mm -hmm. And you go in there, it's mostly drinks, but on I think Wednesday they have a depression, you know, tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. And it's like eating in, on board the Jules Verne submarine. It's that good. So, uh, and this, so this guy will do the, uh, the Clifton's with great aplomb, yeah. I'm sure. They also have a special drink that you can order at the Edison. It's called the Herbie. <laughs> and it's in honor of Herb Ryman. I don't know what it is, but, but because the Edison is a, a, uh, a great sponsor and uh, uh, contributor to Ryman. Yeah. And they're also working so, with us on Pleasure Island on the reconfiguration of that, so that will be a beautiful place. It's gorgeous. There's lots of great places. Downtown is coming alive again. Yes. And right. when you take his tour of the Union Station, of course, Pearl Harbor was filmed in there, so that's another yes. yeah, And then great. finally, Hunchback, I was fortunate enough to get to see that in Berlin, and I'm going again because it was absolutely the best Disney theatrical thing I've ever seen. So. I hope, they were worried that it was a little too dark, that version, so they said we have to lighten it up for America, so we'll see what, they, you know, the Germans, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so they, they followed Victor Hugo more to the letter of the law, I think, on that version, but the music is done, so, all right, now I'm up to date, but I'm sitting there going, I have something I can say about that, I have something I can say about that. all right. Okay, well, when Dennis asked uh, Tony to come speak today, uh, we were strategizing what to do, and uh, if we had, had Tony speak on one subject, it might disappoint the others who did, may not want to hear that. about a specific subject. So we decided we'd do a conversation, and actually we did this for the NFFC Legends Award. I thought it was just a few years ago. It turns out to be 10 years ago. <laughs> Funny how that happened. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I thought it was a couple years ago. It was 10 years ago. <laughs> no. Well, we still think of like Beauty and the Beast and the Lion King as the new Disney movies, but yeah. believe me, when you talk with young people, that's one of the years. old films <laughs> that, before they went to CGI. So those are prehistory now. <laughs> so what, what we want to do today is just have a conversation as if we're talking in Tony's uh, living room. So think of some questions, because towards the end I'm going to open it up and you guys can ask questions as well. But I'll start it off with some, some things, and hopefully I'll ask questions that you've not heard before, and you'll give us answers to things that we've not heard before. Or I won't say anything. Or you won't say anything. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to, uh, I guess, how did you get interested in Disney? Because your entire career has been Disney. Yeah, well, I bought those $1.50 uh, child ticket books, you know, because I could afford them. And um, they were about the same as going miniature golfing. I mean, that shows you how prices have changed. But I think it was about a dollar to go over in Santa Ana on 17th Street. Does anyone remember that miniature golf on 17th? And, uh, or if I could weasel my mom into about a dollar more, I could ride my bike 10 miles to Disneyland. That was before it, that would be considered child endangerment. <laughs> I would head over 17th and then up Harbor and then I was home free. And so that became kind of a ritual. Um, and I built those kind of, you know, what a kid would do in the backyard trying to do nature's wonderland or, um, you know, whatever we could figure out. We could run people through in wagons or build, we built underground, you know, forts where I would dig trails through the backyard and there would be a, a haunted graveyard kind of theme to it. 
Um, so and then in dark rides in the garage, and I bought you know one of the coolest shops in Frontierland was the Mineral Hall, which was an exhibit. But then at the end you ended in a gift shop. What a novel idea! And uh, it was minerals, but they had a whole black light section, and this was before the hippie era, so it wasn't like psychedelic or anything. It was just pure magic out of the Disney dark rides. That was what it what it was, and, and so saving up thirteen dollars one. Here, I think when I was in seventh grade, I got a black light. And that was the beginning of, um, you know, I still have that light. And by the way, the bulb has not burned out. So when you hear about LED lights and all that, I still have a black light that still works from 1950 something. And they had all the Crayolas and the paints and everything that you could buy with it. So uh, one thing led to another, and I had a garage where we'd do these. I pushed people on a lawnmower that I turned upside down and so I push long, long. So they were right out in the show set, so I could push them right up to a horrible thing and then back them out of it. And so, um, yeah, I just never thought it would translate into getting anything other than my dream job was to work in operations at Disneyland, you know. And so I did get to do that. But it's funny how, I don't know if you've ever gone back to your high school and there's a nostalgia about it, but you clearly know you don't belong there anymore. And it's funny how, as you go through life, you know, these things that were dreams and whatnot, you know, I've, I've gone back and I've worked the rides during Christmas parties and stuff. But, you know, that, there was a, a specialness about it when it was an unobtainable goal that, I don't know, you're always looking for the next goal, you know. So once I got into operations, it was okay, now what? And I thought I might teach, you know, so I was going to school preparing to teach and uh, ended up um, going, what the heck, let me try this Disney thing and see if I can get in and I, uh, they like my stuff, so that was that. Was that. Well, you started at Carnation Plus. I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, what was it we were watching? Oh, they, they showed Parent Trap up at the El Capitan and they all, they had Carnation Milk at the, uh, I said, even then they had product place, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Carnation. Uh, Plaza Gardens was my primary home, but they would farm us out to the various locations. But the neat thing, I was about 17 and a half, and uh, Disneyland had very strict hiring policies of 18, and then generally the younger people got either into merchandise or foods, and so they really, you know, dangled the carrot out there to get into operations. It was harder. And, uh, but when I hired at Carnation, it was a leasee, and two weeks after I hired, they became, uh, they were taken out over by Disneyland. So uh, my status, which was on Carnation as a permanent full-time employee, was instantly, I achieved that with Disney because they, they had to match Bye. everything over. And so that normally took a, nor uh, you know, a, a kid that was going to school about two or three years to achieve that level. So when I did get my retirement, it goes all the way back to that summer that <laughs> so that was, I was very lucky with that. Wasn't it odd that your last project yes. was Fantasy Fair, I, which yeah. was the redo of Carnation Plus? Well, I had um, that in mind all along, that uh, I was really bummed out by a certain person who took the restaurant out of oh, about five, ten years ago. <laughs> the initials are P, P. Uh, and that's what he was. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so I, you know, that area had died. I mean, it was once active, and yeah, occasionally at night they'd have a dance, and then there'd be a pathetic thing in the afternoon where a school would have their choir there, and the three parents that came as chaperones would be sitting out in front in four chairs. You know, but it, it, the dynamics of it was gone, and I said, it's next to the most famous piece of architecture probably in the United States, you know, and there's no one here. It's become a dead zone. And so we concocted the idea of bringing the princesses from a meadow out in the back, which didn't, for me, make any sense at all, to up by the castle where they would, that's where they would live, you know. So that's, that's what we did. And um, I'm pleased to say it's busy there all day now. And <laughs> it's a, kind of a happy area again instead of dead. Well, since you left Disney. I mean, if I, people have asked, well, what's Tony doing these days? I haven't left Disney. I go in one day a week. My extension number is still the same. My email is still the same. I go in and I get a pile of memos that have accumulated in the four days I haven't been there. So 
all that means is instead of sitting in that room doing it all, I do it at home. So the house is now piling up with rooms. So these are things I have yet to answer, and these are things I'll never answer, but I've got to keep. And uh, I do. Uh, and that's kind of the fun part. Um, I, I've kind of figured this out, um, that when I hired in, there was a huge age gap between me and the people like Mark Davis and Claude Coates and John Hinch. So they were in their 60s, maybe even 70s, like John was probably 70. And, um, and I was in my early 20s, you know, so there was this massive gap. And the only person that fell in the middle of this was Rolly Crump. And Rolly Crump always had a problem, you know, fitting in. And the, I would later find that out as I moved into later age categories that when you have people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, they're all vying for the same you know, spotlight, I think it is. And uh, whereas when you're in your 20s and you're working with people in their 60s, they really want to encourage, you know, young people and help them along. And young people in their 20s are so nervous about succeeding and learning it all that they're very eager to have that relationship. So I think that there's a fallacy that you've got to keep filling slots. Because all you do is have people that are jealous of the other people and trying to take over and, and all of this. Whereas when you have that gap that was by accident, these guys just got up to that age and they went, you know, we're not going to be here forever. We better start hiring in. And I was very lucky to get hired in. Uh, but I think in the end, when I look at that, I said, that's probably the most healthy relationship. So I've decided, you know, now that I'm at that end of it, I deal with all these people that are in their 20s. And it's just a great relationship. And, and the thing about mentoring that people don't understand is it's two-way. So if I teach them anything, the most other important part of it is that I get something out of them. And so I try to go to all the things that their age group goes to. So if you haven't been to Comic-Con, you should definitely do it. It's almost impossible to get in. Uh, the tickets go on sale and Mark can attest if you don't. There was a great, last year was a Big Bang Theory where they're going, refresh, 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 refresh. Because Thursday's gone. No, Friday's gone. And honest to God, it's like that. But it is crazy, it is goofy, but you really get, you know, where they're all going to and what are they excited about. And I think it's important that you have to embrace that because when we were that age, that's what Disneyland meant to us. And so the, the constant dilemma is for Disneyland to mean something to our generation as well as uh, it be exciting to them. Well, speaking of mentors, Claude was a mentor. Yes. Claude Coates yes. was a mentor to you. Yes. Talk a little, I mean, you don't hear much about Claude. No, because he was quiet. And Mark was, of course, um, very successful before Imagineering in animation. And uh, the f characters that he did are legendary, you know, from Alice in Cinderella and uh, the evil villains of Maleficent and the stepmother um, so forth. Uh, so, you know, it was, he, he got this, got the spotlight and still does. I mean, the, the newest uh, copy of Sleeping Beauty has a wonderful 12-minute thing on um, the villains and uh, they speak reverentially about Mark Davis. But from, for someone who worked in the parks, I always thought the rides were more about going into the places that we loved in these films, whether it was Nature's Wonderland where we saw <laughs> the living desert and all the places that came to life out of the nature films, or the same thing was true of the jungle, um, or it was the dark rides which took us into the cartoons. And you, you weren't playing the role of Snow White so much, but you were getting to do the things she got to do, and, and these things were happening to you. Um, so I was, I think, always more predisposed to the worlds in the Disney movies, and that's why I think Sleeping Beauty has always been my favorite, because Ivan Earl really took over that film, and in fact all the animators had to kind of follow his rules about what they were going to animate. And some people find that a flaw of Sleeping Beauty, but I find it the asset of Sleeping Beauty, because um, in terms of its repeatability, you can watch it over and over again. So I think that had a lot to do with the fact that the paintings, as I think, uh, I forget the animator that said it, you could stop the movie on any frame and you have a gorgeous, frameable painting. And I think that's true. But uh, not getting to work with Ivan Earl, probably the next most featured background and color styling person was Claude Coates. And uh, when I got there, he and Mark were partners on shows like Pirates of the Caribbean, and uh, when Walt passed away, 
they were very different individuals. Uh, Claude was very uh, welcoming of uh, input and everything, and, and Mark was, uh, I won't say set in his ways, but he was so capable of doing it, it was, you know, it was hard for him to open up and, and include other people in, well, why don't you design this uh, secondary character? That wouldn't happen. Every character of the Bear Band was designed by Mark, and then he would give you a picture and say, okay, I want this lantern on the wall just like this. Claude would say, why don't you take that back to your desk and see what you can come up with? And for me, that was what I like to do. I, you know, I'd much rather, you know, be creative myself. So, um, we, he, the first thing that I saw he was doing was a Snow White work ride from Florida, and I uh, asked if I could work on it, and um, he, uh, you know, opted for putting me on the team. And then, like I said, I would go back to my area and I'd come back and goes, that's a great idea. I think we'll show that to Card Walker, who was head of the company at the time. And I figured, well, that'll be great. I'll find out how it went when it's over. And, and then Claude said, you know, Card's coming over today, so I want you there. And I went, you want me? I'm like 22 years old. Like, what? You know? And not only was it that, but he would, he would say, okay, Card, uh, I don't think you met Tony Baxter. He just started here. He's really brilliant. He's got this idea. So Tony, why don't you show Card what you what you have? So I mean, this was an incredible relationship, and it was like I said, I learned as much both ways. I think he learned from me. He was open enough to, you know, take the way I thought as a twenty-something and combine it with the way he'd been trained with all these years uh, in animation. So we both grew out of that. I learned how to paint backgrounds. Certainly not as good as as he did, but I've got one hanging in my house um, that I slaved over for about six weeks and decided I'll never do this again. But I now very much appreciate people who can do this. And the same thing, I, I think he really learned something that no one in the initial batch of Imagineers, and this was my, I think when I got there, I, I was trying to figure, how did I end up here? This doesn't really make sense. You know, these people are on TV and all of that. Uh, but then I realized that Walt Disney was the one that had the ideas, and he had a staff of people that were really good at making those ideas uh, come to life. And he died all of a sudden. Nobody, everybody you hear the stories, they go, we didn't know, you know. Uh, he was here, and he came in my office, and then that was the last of it, or whatever. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't something that was being discussed or thought about. It was just suddenly, he's not there. But true to Walt, he had left so much to do that they could kind of continue on. But when I arrived in the 70s, we were bringing Walt Disney World up to life. And uh, once that was done, it was kind of, aside from the vague idea of Epcot, there was no drawer to pull out of Walt's, Walt's ideas. You know? So um, what I fell into is, a, as a kid, buying those $1.50 and then later $2 books when, they went, when I got to be 13, even though I cheated for about a year and a half, and, you know, got up to the booth and said, one, one child. <laughs> 50 cents would buy you a lot at Disneyland if you could talk her into giving you the lower price. <laughs> um, anyway, after I, I got there, I realized I knew what it was like to go through that gate and go pay my ticket and go into a ride and be blown away by it. Whereas everybody that worked there knew what it was like to make one of those. They knew what it was like to paint the background, to stage it. But they didn't know what it felt like emotionally to go through it and, and how it affected you and all of that. So that, you know, while my talent was nowhere near what theirs was and the years and years of, of honing their skills, I knew how to make things that were fun. You know, and I had that burning idea of like, these are things that would be really fun to do. So uh, as they were, as these, you know, bins were more and more empty of walled ideas, uh, they'd start saying, well, maybe Tony should think about whether he's got an idea for that. And so that was sort of the start of Big Thunder. You know, they didn't know what to do. And they weren't, at this point, they had turned around the idea of doing Western River Ride because uh, the big complaint in Florida was no Pirates of the Caribbean. And Western River was going to be a East Coast version of Pirates of the Caribbean. So it was all about cowboys and Indians doing the thing that pirates and townsfolk would have done in the Caribbean ride. And they thought, since they're way far away from the West, it'll be very appealing. But then the number one complaint was, why would you go to Walt Disney World if they don't have the pirate ride? Was this the best ride at Disneyland? So they scrambled and did what I feel is an inferior, way inferior pirate ride. 
but it pretty well put the nails in the coffin for ever doing Western River because it was essentially the same formula going into a town that was all besieged by bandits and hoodlums that were, you know, revving up the town and the, and the gals were out there dancing and all that stuff. It also had a few politically, you know, things that were starting to become sensitive. Um, so, you know, they said, well, what are we going to do? You know, because it was an, an original wall kind of thing. And um, so I said, well, what if we broke it in, in two? We could build the, the, you know, the big Thunder Mountain out in front out on the piece of land, and then we'll put the show building in the back for Western River Ride. So that was how that began. And um, it, it was just over time I started to say, well, to see that this little kid view of like, wow, I, I know what would be fun, you know, was like a, a huge thing that people that do it for a living, they've always waited to get a task. Okay, Claude, we want you to do the sets for the Haunted Mansion. No one could do it better. Mark, we want you to design this, the bear band or whatever, pirate characters. No one could do it better. But uh, sitting down and saying, well, what should we do? That was sort of a, an empty gap hole that um, I started to get the opportunities to do. So, And Claude was uh, so congenial in, in uh, giving me those initial chances to do that, that, um, you know, that was, it was you know, just something that I treasured and we became very good friends. I remember he came to my house and I stayed living with my parents till like 26. And so here was this guy that was this older, older than my parents coming over to my house in Tustin, and we had to go up the stairway to my bonus room on the second floor, you know, through, and my parents were all downstairs. I said, this is weird. You know, <laughs> you know, but he, he never, you know, it never phased him. They were just decent, really nice, nice people. And so when, you know, the last time I talked to Claude, Claude I was in Paris, and I just got the inkling to make this phone call because the park looked so good. And it was really because of him, you know, I, I'd learned so much from him. And I remember I called at the hospital because he was in a really bad condition at that point. And they had just taken a breathing tube out. So he was within like a five minute period where he could talk. So I talked with him on the phone, told him he'd be really proud of it. And when you get better, you know, that you're going to love seeing this. And it's all the stuff you've, you've got across to me, I hope. And... Uh, and he didn't make it. He, that was that was the last time I talked to him. But they, when I came back, uh, um, Abby, his wife, asked me to do um, a eulogy at the service. So I, I felt like, wow, I certainly did was able to bridge that that gap. And I think the two of us learned a lot from each other. And uh, it was just a great, great, great relationship. But when you look at he and Mark working together, that's Pirates of the Caribbean. Walt died, and then the Haunted Mansion, there's a little bit of fracturing in that where you can definitely see areas that are Mark Davis and areas that are Claude, you know, where it's spooky, it's Claude, where it's lots of fun, loving ghosts, that's Mark Davis. Um, and you didn't have Walt saying, come on, guys, let's work together, you know. And then uh, once that was completed, because that was started under Walt, um, you get to things like America Sings and Country Bear Jamboree, which were 100% Mark. No environment, but fabulous, fun-loving characters. And then you go to Claude, Adventure Through Inner Space, and if you add wings, no characters, but amazing environmental things. So it, it, it's again, it's a tribute to what Walt did in that I think he was the greatest orchestra leader, bringing those people together and getting great environments and great characters all in the same grade. Okay. <laughs> this is going till 5 o'clock. Okay. Uh, well, you were talking about the old guys not realizing what they were doing. Uh, well, that, not quite that. Um, no, well, yeah. no, 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 no. I, I take that back. Yeah. Um, well, when you were doing Epcot, yes. you, you guys were put in a position of designing yes. something yeah. that was, well, it's not really Walt's vision, but it was mm -hmm. what the company thought would be Walt's mm -hmm. vision. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, because Epcot to, to a younger generation is our Disneyland. Yeah, that they they have that lens of yes, it something is something that yeah. they've grown up with mm -hmm. and it's beloved to them, much like Disneyland is to us. So, did you have uh, certain feelings when you were designing that? Because you were you, there were a series of artists, designers that worked on that project mm -hmm. that were different than 
the original, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of a second generation group. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that journey. Well, you just, you just <laughs> gave me a 30 minute answer <laughs> there. I, I mean, Epcot was one of the best times ever uh, because it was the last thing that we knew Walt wanted to do, but probably what he had envisioned would have been near impossible to do. Um, you know, things like the People Mover, I get this question all the time. Well, the People Mover, the way it was at Disneyland, was an energy eater of the first order. It was motors running all along the track, and whether there were cars or not, they were running. And I think the electric bill on that attraction was something like three times the next one down. So if you remember that Epcot story about Dad will get on the thing and wave goodbye in the morning, and then it runs all day with nobody on it, no, no guests at the park. It's just waiting until 5 o'clock for, for to bring it home. So things like that. And I'm sure, you know, if Weld had lived, it would have all morphed and they would have figured out some way around that. But what I keyed on, and we didn't do either, was I love the line Walt said, where you will live a life you can't find anywhere else. And I thought that's what they should have hooked onto, because that doesn't say you have to live there in a house, but you can go there and live there and have this kind of new world, new uh, city uh, the life experience that might be for the four or five days that you live there. So I saw the hotels being integrated into Epcot and the living spaces so that after, you know, say two years or whatever, you close part of it down and you revamp it up. Because if you were living in a home that had to be this demonstration home for it being Epcot, you know, to have people come and say, okay, on December 30th, you got to move out because we're going to rehab your house and change it all. And you get into these you know, political things that are just nightmares for cities. And in celebration, uh, the city we finally built down there, eventually Disney had to offload that because of the uh, urban requirements and things that you get into with, you know, hospitals and churches and all the stuff that just becomes something that the company uh, is in a, in a good position to deal with. So I, I was really hanging on to that, where you will live a life you can't, find anywhere else. So I thought about, wouldn't everyone want to live in countries all around the world in the World Showcase? And wouldn't people want to live in futuristic things that celebrate living out on the land or under the sea and all these different things? You could book an underwater, you know, uh, room or you could build one out in the desert or whatever, all these things that we were, we were talking about. But I couldn't, you know, that, that didn't seem to have a, you know, a precedent. And, a, and a, when you're working with Transitional management, and that would be from Walt's death until Michael and Frank, there's constantly this, what would Walt have done? What would Walt do with this? And so they're looking for, like, where's the precedent? And so there was no precedent of, um, you know, creating living space inside of a theme park. So that was kind of uh, put aside. So we all jumped on, and I think Marty was the person that, Marty Scalar kept the idea of Epcot alive and, you know, made it happen. And I, I was sitting in his office one day and we were chatting about something. He got a call from the head of engineering who said that the energy pavilion was impossible. That they would studied it and that even though Exxon was on board, uh, there was no way they could make those things do all that they were going to do and then feed the uh, batteries from the roof. You know, so it was a solar panel thing back in 1982 running all of the electronics for the ride. And he said, we've only got a year or whatever and can't be done. And Marty, I remember on the phone, he goes, John, he says, if we don't keep this part in the project and, Epcot, uh, and Exxon leaves, you know, the project, then General Motors will leave the project and this will happen and there isn't going to be an Epcot. So you are going to make that pavilion work and it will open on opening day. <laughs> And that's it. And then he hung up and he goes, now where were we? You know? And, I, and I, I think that was a turning point because it was a mandate that we all have an absolute, that we have to, each one of us in our own area has to uh, perform. And because if any, it was so tenuous, you know, they had to eventually link World Showcase and Epcot together because they couldn't get enough sponsorship funding in either one of them to... Um, all the countries that you'd love to see in World Showcase do not have a dollar to be in World Showcase. So, you know, where is Russia? Where is Australia? Where are all these ones that would be really interesting to do? Um, Egypt, 
um, you know, they didn't, there, there was nobody there to participate. So um, it was a very tough thing to get enough critical mass together for that opening day. But once the, you know, the, the pistols were fired and we were off and running, and the last one in was Kodak. So I was uh, working down here on Big Thunder and Marty called and said, uh, we're not going to do the Living Seas for a while, but Kodak wants to be there on opening day. So uh, can you finish that up and then take on the, the journey into imagination? Um, and we all felt like there was something, I think, more powerful about Epcot than anything we'd worked on. It was um, the, the chance for Disney to show the world what can be done that's right about the world. And from what I've seen in the inklings of this Tomorrowland movie, I think they play around with that a little bit about why have we gotten into this dystopian look at the future that every you know high-tech movie or futuristic or you know, superhero movie is about destroying you know, Metropolis or destroying New York City or, you know, the, the ruins of the decay of cities and so forth. And I think, you know, it might be too, um, the public might be too jaded now to accept that, but I think we're going to get a good test of that from what Brad Bird is concocting in the, in the Tomorrowland movie, which is kind of a little girl finding a key to get back to that, um, that look of um, tomorrows uh, that were exciting and and wondrous and all that. So um, I don't quite like where Epcot has gone in the last few years. Where you know the Living Seas was uh, one of the great bodies of water that was you know a sailing environment on land. It's the largest one in the world, and now it's got Finding Nemo as the you know host for it. Uh, you know I think that I, I have a, a very simple uh, thing I try to remember when I work in any of the parks. It doesn't mean you can't do anything in any park, it's just how you frame it up. And if you're doing something in the Magic Kingdom or Disneyland, it's magic made real. So you're taking magical things and bringing them to life in a, a, a theme park. If you're working in um, Epcot, you should be making real things magical. So okay. that means you wouldn't do Finding Nemo, you take the ocean and make that subject magical for people to, to get into it. And at the studio tour, that's how do you make magic. And yeah, uh, that's, that's you know, so a show like the Indie Stunt Show is perfect. Hi, today we're going to tell you about how we did all the stunts for Indiana Jones. So, you know, if you take India as a subject, we can put India in Disneyland, where it's a story where the magic of that movie becomes real. And you really go into the temple and it really happens to you. In the studio, you see how they filmed the movie. And if we were to put it in Epcot, we'd take World Showcase and put exhibits of artifacts that you go around the world and check out all these artifacts, and it's sort of hosted by an Indiana Jones adventure kind of thing, that you know, this is where Indy found this. And, and I, I remember talking that, and then lo and behold, about two years ago, down here at the Discovery Science Center in Santa Ana, Indiana Jones and National <laughs> Geographic come together to produce this thing that had the fake artifacts from the movies combined with real uh, actual artifacts from the National Geographic collection. And it was a fantastic exhibit and it got kids interested in that. So I, I think it just requires more effort rather than taking the easy route of just throwing something that's a nice show. Because if you do that, all of a sudden you've got four parts that are all the same instead of having flavors that Today we want to go behind the scenes. Today we want fantasy. Today we want uh, things that stimulate our minds for the future and for culture. But tomorrow we want to go see animals in their real habitats. Um, and I do think that park does the best job with animals uh, anywhere in the world. I'm always amazed when I go in there and take that gorilla walk. I don't know if you've done that. Mm -hmm. or, or go on the tiger walk. Uh, those are just so stunningly great, you know. So I, I, I handed to Joe to making it a fourth model for that that little statement I had. <laughs> it was, oh, was I was talking about Epcot and, and oh yeah, because you were mm -hmm. you were the the guys creating it. Yeah, and it was it was a little bit of that story that I told you that um, by the very nature of we grew up, you know, and Mark and Mark and I worked at Disneyland at the same time and. When they opened the second floor of Carousel of Progress and showed Progress City, which had been renamed Progress City, it was going to be Epcot, and then Walt died, and they went, ooh, what if we never build it? We better just call it Progress City. But it was clearly 
the model is exactly that rendering that we all saw. So, you know, it was this thinly veiled and we all went, remember we all said, we're going to move there. We didn't know about the humidity in Florida at that time. <laughs> so we all said, oh, you know, as soon as this gets done, we're moving there, you know. So uh, I think the fact that we had that DNA in us about how exciting this idea of fixing all the ills of cities and whatnot would, would be that uh, we were ripe to take lead roles in, in Epcot because that was something that really inspired us as when we were in those impressionable years, you know. Of, of, uh, and if you haven't seen the movie Big, it's a, a perfect essay about someone, like I'm describing, landing in a toy factory and essentially that's what we are as a giant toy factory. And the management doesn't know, some of the management doesn't know what to do with him because that innocent kind of spark that children have about what's fun and, and all of that is still alive. It hasn't been beaten down by the facts and figures of politics and, and running a company and all that. And the, the classic scene for me is always that part where uh, he's playing with a toy and realizes it's a boring toy. And the guy's up there saying, now if you look at our graph, if we're able to extend into the 12 to 14 age bracket with this toy, that'll produce revenues that will generate, you know, 20% more, and blah, blah, blah. And then Tom Hanks raises his hand and goes, I don't get it. There isn't anything fun about a building that turns into a robot, you know. Like, and and I, I thought, like, if you said that, you'd be crucified in a meeting, you know. So uh, it's a very interesting essay because... Some companies like Pixar, I think, and Marvel embrace those kind of people. And I think Walt did too, because I, I saw a lot of these strange, you know, people they would not hire because they're, they, they fill out kind of a, a palette of diversity that made Disney able to do incredibly strong villains like Maleficent and um, Chernabog and Stromboli, and then at the other side, people that could create the most loving and kind and all of that. And if you just, you know, brought, you know, suited executives into the company, you'd have one flavor and one flavor only. So I think that was uh, the brilliance, uh, and that's what I look for. I don't look for people that fit the mold, but, you know, bring some, you know, one of my my favorite co-workers was John Stone, who didn't meet any standards, and yet the guy could do paintings, he could do models, he could do, uh, he could build stuff in the field, and he could do it faster than anyone I've ever worked for, you know, and, and yet he wouldn't meet anybody's requirements as an executive or a, you know, by the longest march, <laughs> and, and the meticulous. And then she'd put a dainty little, like, Mary Poppins apron on, and then she would do get her hands in resin or whatever it needed to be to do it. But she was also like the, before internet and everything, you went to Harriet, you know? And, and when I'd get in, I'd say, okay, so what's going on today? Because Bill Cottrell, who was, goes way back to being uh, creative at, at the studio and then ran WDI, or Imagineering, uh, WED, uh, uh, would come by in the morning and that would start the day. And then John Hench would be by once or twice during the day to talk talk with Harriet. So she was like the radar for what went on. And right next to her was Fred Jurger, who was one of the best and kindest model builders, but very introverted, very private kind of person. Uh, and it was interesting, the dynamics between the two of them, because she was a chatterbox and, uh, you know, just friendly with everyone and kept a status of where the last time she talked with you. So it'd be like, so did your mother get that thing done? You know, and I go, yeah, she did, you know, and okay, and then how did that come out? So she would be compiling another chapter on your, you know, your end. But Fred was like, you'd have to pull, like, so how's it going today, Fred? Oh, fine, you know, fine. <laughs> and then next to Fred was a bird, a minor bird called Joker, who was left a leftover from the Lieutenant Robinson Crusoe with uh, Dick Van Dyke, I think the movie. They didn't know what to do with the bird, so they gave it to Fred. So it sat there in the model shop, and it would scream at Jack Fergus, who was a gentle giant, like seven feet tall and big guy. And he's the one who did all the tiny, tiny sculptural work on like the miniature figures and stuff. They were exquisite. And, and Jack would sit kind of buried in, and we'd hear the bird go, wah, wah, you know, and then Jack would do the same thing in the back, and then they'd get into this. <laughs> <laughs> So those were, 
Then there was the Baroness Glendra von Kessel, who's responsible for all those painted uh, flower glass uh, mirrors in the perfumery. And she had fingernails that were this long, and she was a baroness. And she never knew what day of week it was. And all I can think of is a cross between Cruella de Vil and uh, what was it? maybe uh, Glenn Close's performance in uh, Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> darling, you know, like one of those. And then she'd arrive on Saturday and, and she came by cab every day. And they'd say, We're not open today. You're not. We're not open today. Oh, if I, you know, and then off she would go. And, Yes. It's exactly the same ride system as cars and uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth in Tokyo and Test Track in Florida. Um, the difference is the profile on the tracks and all those other attractions was designed to allow them to swoop around the curves, which we had intended to do. And then when General Motors backed out, we had to look at what can we do for next to nothing to keep it, because um, it's such a signature component with the track being On everywhere, the the track. yeah, and so uh, we we talked to the engineers and they said, well, I think we can moderate the speed enough to slow down around those curves. Well, it really compromised what you experienced as a ride, you know, to have to slow down and then accelerate and slow down. And I used to say it was like how my dad drove the car. <laughs> For the cruise, we had like six or seven little clips that we put together um, for the the cruise people that each of the people on the panel had selected as one of their fun things. So I'm going to run the first part of it, and then we'll get into kind of what I call a dog's breakfast of stuff. Why is that? Set? Oh, I don't want to join in that one. Cancel. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me pull this guy up. If you don't mind me to shift it so I can get the screen enlarger. Okay, so this is, we're going to run about 15 minutes, and it's, imagine it's Friday night, and you come to my place, and we're going to um, give you a little tour of the house before watching uh, some behind the scenes on building Disney. <laughs> Disneyland, but 
Um, you know, and you don't want to find yourself walking down Main Street and looking at your window. So it's really nice that I can, in the secrecy of my own home, I can look at my window. And for those who want to know where your window is, I think it's the coolest location ever of the magic shop. Yeah, I don't think they could have picked a better place. And I love the, the idea of what they came up with because it's got a little bit of a throwback to Journey into Imagination. We'll move on. Uh, I once had a dining room. You know, normal houses have dining rooms. Right. I kind of have a time machine room. Because where else would you keep your time Yeah, room? so this room is devoted to Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. And this is a time machine. I'm doing a little work on it right now, so there's a few things around the, the dish in the back that are in, in rehab, as we call it at Disneyland. Um, so, but everything in here is something from uh, the stories of H.G. H. Wells or uh, Jules Verne and so forth, things that have meant a lot to me uh, of that period. I, I think I, uh, uh, I was born in the wrong century. I love mechanics more than I do computer sciences. Yeah. So, um, so we'll go on through. Uh, just your normal kitchen with acorn lamps <laughs> lighting it. Um, we'll move right on from that into here, which is kind of fun because uh, I guess Wall really inspired me with this love of trains, and so the Lily Bell was something that was almost unobtainable, but I found a woman who had all the rights to Wall's patterns that were developed in the studio, and so she was still alive about 20 years ago, and so I bought all the kit parts to build this, and I got it about up that far. This is a copy of the Lily Bell. I actually have a Lily Bell plaque that I call my train uh, Thunder Mountain Railroad because that's a little bit more personal to me. Sure. But um, anyway, I got up to about there. When we got to the boilers, that's beyond me. I don't do boilers, so I had uh, a machinist do the rest of it. But I've got a lot of the models of the Disney trains. And then uh, there's Drew Struson's poster for the Indiana Jones ride. When you spend like four years with a concept like Indy, you kind of fall in love with it. So I think I've got every Indy collectible that one can imagine. And they keep coming out with them, even now, like 20 years later. We'll spend a lot of time here tonight in this room because this is our TV room. I wanted a space that looks really cool as kind of a family room during the day, but then I can quickly bring down a screen on the end wall there. So I thought oh, I would like to do this. Yeah, Beautiful. this piece was done for the Disneyland Paris Castle, and uh, I loved it. And it was it was actually woven on the same in the same uh, studios that did tapestries four or five hundred years ago. And they'll only make like six of anything. And this one is number two, and the first one is in the castle, and the other four don't exist. So um, this is it. So you'd have to go to Paris to actually see this hanging up in, in or they'll have walked it along. Course. Uh, so I've all my evil people since it's sort of the theme for the room. And, um, I love Godzilla and some of the other studio props, but Maleficent's <laughs> probably my favorite villain of all time. Yeah. This is one of the few models remaining of the dream vehicle from Journey into Imagination at Epcot. And uh, it was given to Disneyland on the 30th anniversary. They gave me uh, this from Disneyland, so it actually came as a present from Disneyland. So. I love your Rocketeer helmet. Yeah, Rocketeer, the coolest Disney character. Yeah. I wish we could do more of those. Yeah. Why don't we do the series of three of those? Yeah. And his successor, Captain America. So um, I think probably go up in the yard calorie. Okay, great. So, okay. got some really cool stuff upstairs because I love collecting Disney art, so we'll have to get up there to, to find it. Most people have bedrooms, right? Well, I have an art gallery, so and my art gallery, I try to really concentrate the majority of my Disney stuff into this room, so while I have time machines and everything everywhere else, here it really is devoted to my love with Sleeping Beauty and probably the most incredible science fiction uh, object that's ever been created in novels, which Harper Goff did for Disney's 20,000 Leagues. Um, so here you see about 10 of my not a lie and a copy of the book that opens the film that you see Walt Disney holding this in the television show. And it's uh, on camera in the curtains part, at the start of the movie. Amazing detail. I end up like loving this one, and then I find somebody comes up with one that has lights in it. You can see the organ and everything inside, <laughs> so I have to buy it all over again. But the main, I think, collection in here is I have admired Disney backgrounds since I was a kid. I think 
it's wonderful. We often give so much credit to the animation, but uh, I think being a ride designer, it's a chance to let people go into the worlds that were created on film and the characters we love in the movies, but in the rides, we get to go into these places. And I think for me, Sleeping Beauty uh, and Ivan, Ivan Earl's artwork was a high water mark for Disney, so I've spent a lot of time collecting his pieces. And some of the things on this wall were actually used in the film. Others are pre-production art. It was done in, uh, you know, establishing what it was going to look like. But this was actually a major scene in the film where Aurora goes to the edge of the forest. Um, one up here is interesting because it was shot twice. Uh, Philip writes to the uh, uh, little cottage in one way, and the three fairies come later in the film. So it was used a couple of times. In the center of all the Sleeping Beauty pieces is the, the Chateau de la Belle of Bois de Mont. And I apologize for my really bad friend. This was created for Disneyland Paris. It's the poster you'd see in the park. And for me, it represents kind of one of the best things I ever got to do in my career at Disney, which is uh, lead the effort creatively in Paris. But I think Tom Morris and uh, Tracy Trinis, who uh, designed this, came up with a perfect blend between something that's French, it has that historic look of uh, you know, the early turn of the century uh, artwork, but it also looks like Disney. And I think that combination uh, is what we were looking for, and it just nailed it. And so I put it there as, as the centerpiece of my collection. It's kind of a crowning you know, element. You know, your bedroom is a place you spend a lot more time than anywhere else. So I always had this thing, I had to be looking at really cool stuff. So that's where when we were building the house, I actually self-contracted. And when we got to really intriguing things like this fireplace, I actually did some of the handwork myself because when we built Big Thunder and we did Splash Mountain, I kind of learned how to do the carving of cement and turning it into looking like snow. So uh, the one thing I didn't do was that head. I locked that in and kind of blended all the cement around it. And on Monday when all the, the construction workers came back, they said, you carved that? And I go, yeah, I'm really good, aren't I? You know, so. <laughs> also down below are the uh, maquettes that were used in the movie uh, Beauty and the Beast, um, which kind of goes with all this too. I have a lot of Indiana Jones stuff, but I think probably one of my favorite things is this rough sketch is one of Drew Struson, who's the other great poster artist. There's Bob Peek and Drew. Drew did all the indie posters and Star Wars and Back to the Future and Harry Potter, but this is one of his um, early concepts for Indiana Jones. This is kind of fun because some friends of mine work at a uh, studio that scans your head. Does he look familiar? Yeah, that looks like me. Yeah, it actually made me look better than I look. So whatever the computer is, the cars these things. Um, I like that. Oh, my head. Oh, I lost your head. Yeah, I'll that later. Uh, over on this wall, going back to the dawn of animation, uh, this is a, a frame from the first recognized kind of animated film, which was Curdy the Dinosaur. And a Windsor McKay? It's a Windsor McKay, and they didn't have cells, so they had to do the entire background and the character for each frame. So if you were shooting 16 or 24 frames, there are literally, you know, 24 drawings complete, completed to do that. Down the Disney's Hollywood Studios, the Gertie the Dinosaurs and Ice Cream of Extinctions. Thing. Yes, yeah, it is. So, you know, I kind of look at it saying, if that film hadn't happened, where would we be, <laughs> you know? And down below, again, this probably should have gone downstairs with my bad guys, but Schoenbach hasn't completely unfolded yet. But this was by the artist Kai Nielsen, who directed that whole sequence in the, in the film and has always been, if you look at it, the Art Deco styling of that is just really beautiful. And I wish it was unfolded a little more, but you can't, when you get a chance to find something like that, you have to sure. go with it. The oldest thing that I have in this room is, for me, is this castle model up here, which uh, I did when I was 15. And I think it still lights up. Let me see if I can get a few of the lights to, to turn on. And it was in my mom's garage. And when she passed away, I saw it there all covered with the dust, and I cleaned it up. And lo and behold, some of the lights came on when I turned the switch. So uh, I did it. She was a school teacher, and I made it out of construction paper and uh, plaster of Paris and things that you'd find around the house, and little toothpicks for the finials and so forth. It looks okay from the front. If you saw the back of it, you'd really know that I didn't have any research. But who knew back then that someday you would create? No, my mom said it looks like a real Disney park. She thought it looked real, really nice, and she said, let's enter it in the Orange County Fair. And we did, and I got a blue ribbon, and in the paragraph about winners in the uh, hobby division, it was, you know, blue ribbons. And 
I got my name in the paper, and that was very exciting. Hey, Ryan, you know, there's one more thing I want to show you before we go in. It's certainly got to be the biggest souvenir that's ever been taken from Disneyland. But these olive trees stood in the hub in the park from opening day until our 50th anniversary. And when they were coming out for the fireworks show, I said, I have got to save those. Probably more people have taken pictures of these trees than any in the world. And um, now we're actually getting a view of it again that you guys are all seeing. Uh, but when we moved them up here, we had to cut them way back, and you can see where it was chopped from uh, being at Disneyland. But nature takes over. It's already replaced that with a brand new branch here. How'd you get the trees from Disneyland to here? That must have been. Well, you know, there's one sure. crane big enough to park out on the street and literally lift them over my house into this property on the side here. So uh, the neighbors thought it was crazy, but you know, I figured when Walt created Disneyland, he put in these 50-year-old trees that were now 100 years old at the 50th. And I just couldn't see him going. So uh, actually, Michael Broby did a really nice plaque for these that talk about these standing mm -hmm. in Disneyland for 50 years. So um, here they are, and they're still we're just enjoying Anaheim. <laughs> we're still in the same city. So it's kind of neat to have yeah. literally the biggest souvenir from Disneyland ever. <laughs> and you're here. One of the other trees I really wanted to see, I'm kind of sentimental about this one because when I worked at Disneyland, sometimes they'd have me go out and work the popcorn cart in the hub. And this is where it stood, right about where we are. It's 15 cents for popcorn back then. But I actually still have a picture, and you can really see this branch up here behind it. And it's me with my grandma back in about 1968, standing right in front of this tree. And who would ever think when you're a kid that that's going to be in your front yard? I know, so here it is. Yeah, and uh, again, I haven't rewired it completely yet, but one of these days, so let's go in and see some movies. All right, great. Okay. Sounds good. Come on in, everybody. You're all invited. Pick a seat and have some vanilla taffy as traditional. Somebody call it a number. Any number between one, six. Disc number six at Disneyland. 1955. Pretty cool, Tim. You picked a good one. All right. Could have gone all the way up to the 80s, but we get the before this event's open. That's pretty cool. Who has an idea for the next one? Anywhere from 25. That sounds like a good one. Okay, so this is the bucket. The bucket Yeah. Okay, so uh, who's going to call it out this time? Well, it's not 55, but it's pretty interesting. There is some folk about to come down with their pirate ride. Yeah, there's somebody wandering around over there. That's more exciting than they had in years. <laughs> of the, this footage that I've shown. Uh, probably some of you have seen it, but it's always really fun. So I can run about 10 minutes. This is the kind of thing that we found uh, about 200 hours of it. And um, actually, this is not the one I wanted to show you. So, so I think I'm going to, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to reload a better one. Or do you want to watch both of them? This one, a lot of this footage was shot for a movie called 40 Pounds of Trouble. Oh. And it's in uh, widescreen. 
which they use as uh, B-roll footage to uh, put in that film.
get the gist of what we're doing on Friday night. Um, so we created a ride through of Journey to Imagination. So for those of you who haven't written the original ride or missed the original ride, this is about as good as um, it's going to do. Yay. Unfortunately, the company never, um, never re re really did a uh, recording of this. Um, and so what we relied on here is original art and ride throughs taken by guests. Only about five seconds of the actual ride.
set. <coughs> Look at nature at this speed. From germination, then back to sea.
Jesus jumped down off the bar. <laughs> Let's show him some real fancy shooting. Get out your five shooters and let's have at it.